national politics is a bit like showbiz. I mean, yes. you know, they, they, these big, sexy races that everyone wants to give money to and get involved with and guess who's going to win and watch the polls. That's nothing like what we do. Welcome to You Decide. I'm your host, Errol Lewis. The States Project is an organization that believes state legislatures are the strongest force for change in our country. It's a democratic aligned group that believes that no matter who wins the presidency this year, it is state legislatures that will pass the policies that most of us have to live with. It's state level laws and policies that protect or attack our personal freedoms and they improve or harm millions of lives. It's at the state level, for example, that things like gun control and abortion rights are really playing out. And so the state's project is one of the most strategically savvy groups that focuses on this. They look for opportunities to flip an entire legislative house or to block a supermajority in a particular state. The organization was co-founded in 2017 by ex-New York State Senator Daniel Squadron. And this year, the state's project is focusing on the following states. Arizona, Michigan, Minnesota, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Kansas, New Hampshire, Nevada, and Wisconsin. Here representing the state's project is the actress, J. Smith Cameron, and returning to the podcast, Melissa Walker. Now, Melissa, who's been on with us before, is a young adult fiction writer who in 2016 uh, went into political activism. She's now head of the giving circles at the state's project. Those circles are groups of people who come together and pool their resources to create change. Think of it like a book club or a group chat that decides to take strategic political action all together. She's gonna to explain more about that in a minute. Jay Smith Cameron is a veteran New York actress who recently found international fame through her portrayal of Jerry Kelman in the hit show Succession. Uh, you remember that. Uh, the role earned her two well-deserved Emmy nominations and an incredibly devoted fan base of which I happen to be a member. Uh, she also starred in uh, season three of another hit show, the critically acclaimed comedy Hacks, which just got an amazing 17 Emmy nominations. She somehow still finds time to lead a giving circle. That's why she's here today. Uh, they pool donations from over 400 people. That's a pretty big circle. And they're helping to flip state legislatures. Her circle is called the State Fair. So welcome to both of you. Thanks for being here. Great to see you. Nice to be here, Errol. Um, Melissa, I want to start with you. I know you became involved um, not all that long ago, but there's a lot of anticipation about this year. And I think of the state's project as, in part, um, an answer to some of the despair that many Democrats are feeling. What's the, what's the game plan for, for this year? Well, I agree with you because focusing on state legislatures has been a form of therapy for me. While chaos swirls at the federal level, when we stay grounded in state capitals where all of these laws are moving, we can really impact change. So every year our team does a 99 state chamber analysis. It's 99 because Nebraska is unicameral. And we figure out where it's possible to shift power, where power needs defending, or where something like breaking a right-wing supermajority is possible. Mm -hmm. And once we zero in on that, we focus on the target districts we need to shift power in these states. And it's really a set of brass tacks tactics that we bring to these states. So door knocking, field teams, um, ad testing ads, these are the types of things that can really move the needle. And these races are often decided on the margins. You know, in 2022, when we worked in a bunch of states, we were in 59 races that were decided by fewer than 1,000 votes. Wow. So this is a place where people can have real impact. And that has given me such hope and grounding, especially in this wild year. Now, do you have any sense of whether Democrats are about to get swamped? A lot of the panic around the Biden nomination, around the, the presidential race, is based on an assumption that uh, the top of the ticket is going to do poorly and that they're going to take down uh, the rest of the ticket, that people running for county legislatures and state legislatures and city councils all over the country are all going to lose along with the top of the ticket. Well, I think that's something that people do worry about, but it's actually something that our tactics can really help with. So one of our main tactics is we run a candidate door knocking challenge. And that means that candidates are incentivized by additional campaign contributions to knock on doors personally. That type of attention to detail and attention to their constituents it can be a real game changer in terms of these races. In 2022, in Pennsylvania, we had candidates involved in this challenge in tipping point seats, and they knocked on five times as many doors as candidates outside of the challenge. Uh -huh. That was thousands and thousands more doors. And what that is, is connecting with voters, 
and not talking about the national scene, but talking about the local school and grass on the sidewalk and the traffic patterns that are bothering everybody, because these are neighbors. These are folks who go to the state capitol and represent local issues. Now, Pennsylvania, in 2022, we were able to help flip 12 seats. The last one, we won by 63 votes. Wow. So that is the type of thing that is absolutely game-changing, no matter what's going on in the national level or the top of the ticket. And was was that the, the, the year that uh, Democrats took back control of the lower house of Pennsylvania? That's exactly right. Flipped right. the state house. And then that was after like, you know, a dozen years of, of Republican dominance in that Absolutely. Chamber. Yeah, okay, so it happens. So now, Jay, how did you get involved with the, the, the state's project? Well, actually, through my friend, Melissa Walker, uh, we were... Um, I think both our <laughs> our minds were blown in 2016 from that. I remember being in London when Brexit happened, and I just remember by the time the elevator got from floor eight to the to the street, I was like, "Oh, and guess who else might win?" <laughs> you know, I just had this like sp spooky feeling, like everything was a, a big hurricane, like in or tornado, like in it's uh, in in uh, Wizard of Oz. Um, so um, Melissa was very comforting because she had this uh, idea that, that is a little hard to get at first, especially if you're not a really political person with a whole background or like a political junkie like so many people are. I'm not. But um, Melissa had this very um, concise, definite, uh, understandable thing, which was like, we, as, as a party, we have not paid attention to state legislatures. And the, and if you read about it, the GOP have decades on us of building up these state houses. So it, it becomes this very concrete thing. Those, those, uh, races don't cost as much to fund. So you actually feel if you're in a giving circle, you create a giving circle, um, that you're doing something doable and concrete and that you can, you can just ordinary, normal people can really make change. Like I think uh, our giving circle state fair backed Pennsylvania, the one we were just talking about, that uh -huh. race we were just talking about. So that was thrilling to think that, you know, we were feeling so hopeless. That's the thing. I, I think Democrats are feeling hopeless right now. I mean, that comes, goes up and down, but definitely this week, I do say, like we all feel a little <laughs> shell-shocked. But this is something that's the antidote to that. Mm -hmm. Like you feel like you're really, there's something concrete to do and it works. And so, so how often does your circle get together? And is it, is it a virtual meeting? Mm -hmm. Is it, is it mm -hmm. coffee and cake? And you know, what, what is I'm it? Gonna, like? I'm going to push for coffee and cake because that's <laughs> right up my alley. Um, no, because we're all, in my, my circle is kind of scattered all over. A lot of our, the people in our sort of our steering committee are in Virginia and PA and Florida and they just, but they have lived in New York and we, they somehow, we all got to know each other. And they, because you don't, we don't necessarily uh, support the state we're living in at the mm -hmm. moment. We, mm -hmm. we, these states are chosen very strategically. Um, so we, no, there, there are Zooms, all, although then there's this wonderful model for raising money, which is getting together in small um parties, like I remember when you were first telling me about it, like just pizza and beer or whatever, sushi party. And kind of, you have to kind of explain the whole concept of going from the bottom up and how that all, as Melissa likes to say, I'm going to steal all your lines, um, that uh, all, everything we care about actually happens. Right. I remember the first time we went, <laughs> that actually happens on the state level. She was like, those people in Washington, they don't do anything. <laughs> and in a way, these things that we're all highly worried about, right. um, you really feel like you can affect that. And that's, it takes a while when you're telling your friends about it. It takes a little bit of time for them to grasp exactly what it is that's that's happening because we're just used to ignoring it. And, and, and you're taking it um, to even a higher level saying, not only are you, uh, do you need to focus on what's happening at the state level, you need to focus at what's happening at the state level in a state that you don't live in, right? That you may not have that's much right. familiarity with. Right. right. That's Very cool. interesting. It is interesting. So, so now, uh, Melissa, t t Democrats are hoping to uh, flip or reach ties in a handful of chambers. I, uh, m I, my notes say Arizona, New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. Um, these are states where the presidential candidates are, are aiming their fire as well. Are you go are you going to overlap? Is it going to be a different kind of a conversation? Yeah, I mean, certainly uh, those are swing states, and so the presidential campaigns are absolutely there. I think that, you know, what's important to know about us is that we are focused very, very particularly on those potential tipping point districts. So we are working with the campaigns, the state caucuses, and the candidates that are in just those 
very particular seats that mm -hmm. we need to shift power. Mm -hmm. Now, the presidential campaign and, of course, a lot of other campaigns are organizing to win statewide. So their strategies are different and they can't do some of the things that we do. The door knocking challenge, for example, is not scalable, right? It's, right. It involves an individual candidate knocking. So that type of thing doesn't play for a statewide win. Mm -hmm. Organizing for state legislative power is a very particular thing that the state's project does, and I wish there were a little more of it, to be honest. Yeah, and, and when it comes to money, we, we just um, saw New York 16, which was one of the, well, the most expensive uh, st uh, congressional primary in U.S. history, just north of here, it included part of the Bronx. Um, you're, the races you're talking about, require much, much less money. Right? Absolutely. It is It is often cheaper to change the balance of power in an entire state chamber than it is to win a competitive congressional seat. Congressional mm -hmm. races cost millions and millions of dollars. State legislative races do not. They're still small, they're still local, and they can still be won, again, on these brass tacks, local tactics. Now, I know, I know the, the state's project is relatively young, but um, part of what happens out of state legislative races is that they become the farm team for people who do go on to run for U.S. Senate or to run for the House of Representatives. Have you seen any, any signs of that yet? Uh, we definitely see some stars. We actually have a policy arm that works on policy with committed key lawmakers. Um, and we see some stars rising for sure. And, you know, on that list, on that list from the past is, you know, a senator out of Illinois, state senator out of Illinois named Barack Obama, mm -hmm. right? These are the people who rise up to national prominence. So you're absolutely right about that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So now, Jay, wh what do you say to your, your colleagues in, um, in the entertainment world, who I imagine are, you know, as artists, are really sort of pursuing their craft, not paying a lot of attention to this kind of work? Well, it's funny, there, there's a real split. There are definitely performers who are kind of out of touch with, with uh, what's going on, but a lot of, a lot of um, people in the arts are very concerned about, you know, they have a humanitarian streak in them and they're mm -hmm. very concerned about, and, and taking some responsibility as citizens. So um, I think it's, uh, it's an easy audience to get actors in a way. It's a little hard, as I said, to get this concept of that, you know, uh, raising money for a state when it seems like such small peanuts compared to, because I think one thing, you know, national politics is a bit like showbiz. I mean, yes. you know, they, they're these big sexy races that everyone wants to give money to and get involved with and guess who's gonna win and watch the polls. That's nothing like what we do. We haven't, you know, most people in America haven't heard of each other's states, candidates, let alone, even their electeds, much less the candidates. So it's, it's a whole different, it's not as, uh, you know, it's not as glitzy, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it's, it, it does more. It's, a, it's sort of like the secret weapon hiding in plain sight. That's yeah, what I like to yeah, say. yeah, no, no, fascinating stuff. I mean, right, some of these are states that, you know, I don't think I've set foot in, you know, in decades, right? But but, but it matters, right? Because who um, uh, who changes uh, the, the laws and the policies in individual states becomes a pattern that starts to spread around the country and it does become uh, of, of, of interest and, and of importance to everybody. Um, I, I gotta ask you some showbiz questions, Jay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we had Warren Light on here. He was talking about the, uh, the writer's strike, which was followed by the, uh, the sag after strike. Um, a lot of people are suggesting that TV and film production did not come back as strong as it once was. In part, that you know this might have been a tactic by some of the production houses to sort of uh, shift some of their production elsewhere. What, what's your sense of that? Um, I don't know exactly what's going on with that, but it definitely seems to be true that there's uh, definitely a step back away from the kind of really um, adventurous uh, the, um, television that was being made for actually like the last decade or so, or longer, two mm -hmm. decades. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems to be a step back, like a little retrograde and like doing only the, you know, considered the safest material. Although I think, I feel like that model has changed because now when I think of the great successful shows, I think of Sopranos and, and, uh, and Mad Succession. Men and Succession. Yeah. Uh, so, but these are, these were considered prestige TV or like, you know, um, more niche and, I, I just hope that they, they'll come back around to it. I think they're just playing it safe. I feel like they, you know, are, I don't know, I can't get inside of the producers' heads, but I'm hoping that, because I think audiences really do like all those choices. It, it really was a golden age, or has been a golden, golden age, age of, I know. Of, of, of dramatic storytelling. So, I mean, I, I, mean, I, I think yeah. these people are not 
you know, unintelligent. They'll figure this out and get it together soon, I hope. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, and let me and let me ask you, um, I, I got to ask a, a succession question. I understand okay. the series has ended <laughs> and so forth, but uh, your, your character, Jerry, um, you were uh, a, a, a powerful woman uh, who had to do sometimes distasteful things, <laughs> although we ended up liking you anyway. And that was true for a lot of the characters there, right? That was just me, though. <laughs> just very like. Well, what, yeah, what, I mean, what, what, that was kind of the, the, the key to the whole series, wasn't it? That there were people doing pretty awful things, not only to each other, but sort of to the world, right? Mm -hmm. And that's yes, kind of what this definitely. corporation was about. Uh, but you ended up liking them anyway. Yeah, I don't understand that. I don't really understand it myself, except that, you know, it was a very funny show. Like, it was really, really dramatic. But they had some of the funniest writers and some of the funniest actors. I mean, Matthew McFadden and Kieran Culkin. I mean, come on. Like, yeah. they're just naturals and, and Nick Braun. And, you know, the writing staff was just extremely, uh, you know, extremely uh, funny and artful. And mm -hmm. they used, they were very collaborative. They really used what the actors had going within themselves. And it, it was an unusual experience for me in that way. Yeah, it was good. It was great writing, um, interesting characters, and the gaudiness of it. You know, these mm -hmm. helicopter flights yeah. and the unbelievable, you know, sort of uh, conspicuous consumption was r really quite something. You know, we, we were always in these fancy places, but everyone was miserable. <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right. That's, that's, that, that was what I most remember about it. Um, you're largely a stage actress, though. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I looked a little bit at your, your biography. Is New York City still a good place for young people to come and try and make it on Broadway? Oh, I don't know. I have no idea. I, th I don't think it's ever been easy. Right. Like, not ever. But it seems like there, that theater is really trying to still make a comeback from COVID and is really um, doing some bold things on Broadway. And there seem to be a lot of plays on Broadway. Mm -hmm. And a lot, much more diversity in general, not just ages, but every, in every way. And that's just really exciting. Okay. Um, All definitely. right, good. What, what, what's, what's next for you? Where should we look Speaking for you Speaking of plays, yes. I'm going to go to London uh -huh. and do a play in the West End. I'm doing Sean O'Casey's Juno and the Paycock opposite Mark Rylance. Oh, boy. Yeah. Okay, very good. We'll keep an eye out for that. Um, now, before I let you, you ladies leave, uh, Melissa, uh, my listener, many of my listeners, and the reason we call the podcast You Decide is uh, people are always trying to sort of figure out what are they going to do in the election? What's going to happen? What do we do? And I always turn back, I turn the question back to them. You decide. You, you got to figure this out. Uh, we all have to figure this out together. Talk my, um, my listeners, my uh, worried listeners off the ledge. What, what, oh. can, what can and should they do uh, between now and November? Well, I think it's really important to find something that grounds you. And for me, that has been a very strategic focus. And I am on year eight of running a States Project Giving Circle with my friends and my families and my neighbors. And it has been such a really unique experience and it has helped me step into my own power. And you do not have to be a witness to what is happening in our democracy. You can absolutely make a change. So my biggest fear are the people who feel hopeless and helpless. I worry about there being too many of those folks. And I urge folks to look not where the glamour is, just where the power is. And to me, these are these 50 mini Congresses in our country that decide everything about the kitchen table issues that we talk about all the time and have a lever over federal power with voting laws and uh, gerrymandering and all of these other things. So it's really important to find a strategic focus and plug in wherever that may be. What, what state should I be looking at? What's a What's, what's one of the more exciting ones you've got on tap? Well, you know, one state that I think we talk about a lot generally, but I think is really hopeful is Michigan. So we've been in Michigan since 2018, but we were able to flip both the state house and the state Senate in 2022. That has enabled Michigan to have one seat majorities, both of which were won by fewer than 400 votes, by the way, mm. that have been able to codify the right to abortion in the state and end right to work laws so unions can be strong again and pass free breakfast and lunch for school children and pass one of the strongest climate bills in the country. That all happened in Michigan because of seats we won by fewer than 400 votes to give a Democratic trifecta to Governor Whitmer. Now that has been incredible change. It's incredibly hopeful. And what happens in one state affects the rest of us, right? Even when we think about something like the Supreme Court, which seems completely out of our control, it was a Mississippi law that took down Roe. And if that one hadn't done it, there were 16 other states that had queued up abortion bans specifically to challenge Roe versus Wade. Those laws are coming from state legislatures. So when we shift power and we elect majorities that are focused on improving lives, we see 
absolutely huge policy change. I assume your adversaries are, are, are on to you now. Is there going to be a big knockdown drag out in Michigan? Well, you know, um, the state's project has been the top funder in Michigan um, on our side. And on the Republican side, it's been the DeVos family. Uh -huh. So um, there is always, of course, uh, major funding on the other side. But the truth is that these races are still at a level where door knocking matters and ad tested ad matters and local press matters. And it, it, there really is a, a diminishing returns point. So we can, we can keep it. We can keep it steady. Okay, I see. There you go. People who are are, are listening, you're very upbeat mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and and smart and savvy, and you can sort of steer people to where they can make the biggest difference. Thank you so much for coming in. Very nice to to see the both of you. That is going to do it for this episode of You Decide. As always, I thank you for listening, and in this case, watching. The episode was produced by me and by Anthony Roman and Maria Abadie. Our executive producer is Bob Hart. It was edited by James Asciutto, and our theme music was composed and performed by Terrence Holloman Lewis and Noah Lewis. I'd love to hear your thoughts about this episode or any of the others. You can find me on social media at Errol Lewis or leave a message for us at 212-379-3440. You can also send us an email at yourstoryny1 at charter.com. And if you're looking for more analysis of politics, you should subscribe to and listen to my colleague's podcast. It's called Off Topic on Politics. Their episodes come out on every Friday. I'll be back next week. We'll see you then.